Today's show is going to be all about ghosts and art, and my guest today is Sarah Sparks. Sarah is an artist in London and collaborates um, on the two, art and ghosts. I first met her when she was given a talk on the ghost hunter, Harry Price, and we're going to discuss him a bit later on. So Sarah, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for for inviting me. (laughs) My pleasure. So Sarah, you're an artist who's worked on a number of projects which have an underlying theme, ghosts. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about this? Um, well, I think maybe go, um, I could go back to the start of the project that I run, which is called Ghost. And it really begins in 2008 um, with an exhibition of that title, Ghost. Although the title has a capital G and a capital H. So there's a host inside the ghost, there's a guest inside the ghost. And... Um, that is an allusion to a artwork by Marcel Duchamp called A Guest Plus a Host Equals a Ghost. And um, the exhibition sort of played homage to this idea of the ghost needing a host um, and how artists acting as kind of, I guess, that their artwork acting as the kind of host, creating a ghost. And... Um, but really, if I'm completely honest, it came, the whole project came out of my love of ghosts <laughs> and fascination with them. So I could try and give academic reasons, but it, it really was rooted in my own um, fascination with ghost stories, um, both novels, you know, short stories, and I mean both fictions, so fictional ghost stories, but also people's accounts of ghosts, you know, so personal accounts of ghosts. Um, that's always really been something I've really been fascinated by. Um, I love films about ghosts. I, I was really interested in any artist who makes a work that, that talks about ghosts. And so together with a friend, Ricardo Vidal, we, thought of, we got together and we curated an exhibition called Ghost, in which artists made ghosts for the exhibition. <laughs> And so that must be all kinds of different things on that. Were people like dressing up as ghosts, painting ghosts? Well, it was mainly it was it, the, the Church of St John and Bethnal Green was where we we had the first ghost exhibition, and um, that space is quite it's very atmospheric. But it also was a listed building, so it limited the kind of things we could do. Um, as in we couldn't put nails in the wall, kind of hang things, um, sort of more, you know, um, a painting or a photograph on a wall. Um, however, this is really, you know, the, a lot of the work that people make that addresses what is a ghost or, or tries to create a ghostly aesthetic is video, performance, sounds or installation. So it worked fine in this context, and that was the kind of work we had. We had performances, we had projections on all different surfaces, you know, we had um, installations with moving image, and we also had a screening of short films by artists, um, which uh, became an ongoing series. Um, we, did this, we did this exhibition and the, the, the screening of artists' short films about ghosts. Um, for a further four times at the um, Church of St John and Bethnal Green. Oh, excellent. <laughs> trying to count how many there were. Was there four or five? I think there was four, yeah. <laughs> Any more coming up soon then, or could um, do it again? Well, that, I mean, that, that went up to 2012. And then after that, the, 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 during that time, there were, other, there were other exhibitions. There was a residency that we both did, myself and Ricardo Vidal, we, we did a residency in Folkestone for the Folkestone Triennale in 2011 where we were set up in an amazing place, space called the B&B Project Space. It's an art space, but it also was an old B&B. So it's on a lovely old shop front right down near the seafront, near the old harbour. And it has a ghost story associated with it. It's alleged it was bombed in the war and someone was killed in the building, so it's haunted as a, as a story there. Um, so we were in that space and we made an installation. We invited artists to respond to local ghost stories and make a piece of work and by the end of our residency which went over about a three month period the B&B space was full of second hand furniture from Folkestone Um, and we had a a little cabinet which was full of artworks artists 
we had Kathy Ward, we had um, uh, Matt Rome, um, and a, a whole um, a whole host of artists making pieces of work responding to ghost stories. Jackie Utley and Sarah Doyle, and the list goes on. And but there's all of their names are on the mm -hmm. ghost website. I wonder if ghosts ever came and had a look at your exhibition when oh, the church was shut, maybe. maybe. <laughs> They and came, the local yeah. Folkestone ghosts, to see yeah. their fame at last, here we are, you know. <laughs> so yeah, maybe they did. And they were certainly looking out for a lot of the images. Mm. I bet they were fantastic to see. Um, you recently did a piece exhibit, exhibited in Taiwan, and um, this was to do with your ghost machine, is that correct? Have I got um, that right? Well, the, yeah, the ghost machine was part of it. Um, I was in a, a group exhibition called No Such Thing as Gravity, which... Um, was initially at FACT in Liverpool um, and then toured to Taiwan. It's curated by Rob Lafrenet and the Taiwan exhibition was curated by Rob Lafrenet and, and Mike Stubbs. And um, as part of this exhibition there were, um, uh, uh, I think there were seven different artists, myself included, who were invited because we make work that explores sort of the territories where science can't formulate any material answers but scientific practices are still applied to try to um, make sense of certain kinds of phenomena, and in my case, ghosts. So um, I had a new commission from FACT in Liverpool, uh, and I made a piece of work called The Ghost Formula, which brought together all the research, really, because Ghost is a visual arts project, but it's very much a research project. So all the research over the past years came together and I created an installation that was a ghost research area and an artwork. Mm -hmm. It had a library of books um, about ghosts that visitors could sit and read. It had uh, a robot called the Ghost Machine that you just mentioned that's based on a neuroscience experiment um, carried out in 2016 in um, Switzerland by Olaf Blanc and his team in which a um, master-slave robot setup is created and uh, one person at a time uses the machine. They stand between two robot arms. They operate one arm, pushing it in front of them in space, almost as if they're poking an imaginary back. Behind them, the other, the, the slave robot responds to their movements, poking them in the back. Oh. Um, but there's a slight delay in between the master robot and the slave robot, the robot that's behind the person poking in the back and that causes a feeling that there's someone there behind you <laughs> and um, so this was people could try this out at the exhibition there was also an area where there were ghost hunting equipment from a friend of mine who's an amateur ghost hunter and people could try they were on sort of open back shelves behind the shelves looking through the shelves there was a ghost puppet seemingly suspended in, in the air, a little marionette, like a, the classic archetypal idea of the ghost, the white sheet, kind of with its arms raised, going boop, you know, it's um, <laughs> suspended there on a plinth. And people could point their ghost hunting equipment at it and um, try to measure, you know, anything from this. Um, and find, there was also within this space uh, a long corridor, which you could enter, like a doorway with a corridor down it, kind of classic sort of thing that you see in horror films, kind of a stretching <laughs> corridor. And then at the end of it was a big circle in the wall in which I um, installed one of my infinity illusions. It looks like a tunnel of light going off into infinity. Uh, and this was called the ghost tunnel. And the idea was it was linked to Williamson Tunnels Heritage Centre up in Edge Hill in Liverpool, where I had built another matching tunnel. So there were two tunnels, one in fact and one in this really intriguing network of tunnels under Liverpool, built by um, a philanthropist, Joseph Williamson, in the um, 1800s. No one knows why. He built miles <laughs> of tunnels under Liverpool, or he had them built, and they're now open to the public. And so I put a tunnel up there, and a tunnel, in fact, in Liverpool, and I created a narrative that these were linked somehow, that somehow, you know, something ephemeral could pass from one That's tunnel right. to the other. Kind of like a ghost wormhole. A ghost wormhole or a <laughs> ghost portal, yeah. So, um, and uh, that element of the project received Arts Council funding. And we are coming to Taiwan, obviously. As a, honestly, this is a long way to get there, but we're getting there <laughs> by Liverpool, we get to Taiwan. So, um, uh, this, this 
element of the project at Williamson's Tunnels was um, supported by Arts Council funding and it was uh, part of the project which was where I researched ghosts in Liverpool. I, I collected ghost stories in Liverpool. I went on to Radio Merseyside and did a call out for ghost stories and um, the various different channels like the Museum of um, Liverpool supported me and got people to send their ghost stories to me via a website which is the, the ghostportal.co.uk and you can see that you can read the Liverpool ghost stories there. And I didn't want to collect um, fictional ghost stories that have been written down. Maybe they origi their origin is from an actual vernacular story, but I didn't want those ones that have been written down already. I wanted people's actual accounts, the first-hand experiences. Um, so I would meet people at Williamson Tunnels with my um, recorder <laughs> and I'd sit and record their ghost stories and then uh, transcribe them and put them onto a website. Um, and I also organised at the Tunnels a programme of ghost hostings. This is part of um, an ongoing series of seminars that are interdisciplinary that um, I've been organising since 2008. There's been 18 of them so far to date, and in Liverpool where we had 15, 16, 17, <laughs> and uh, three ghost hostings. We had sceptics like Professor Chris French oh. speaking, mm -hmm. um, we had Anne Winsper, who is a um, parapsychologist, whose PhD is in EVPs, researching EVPs. Um, we had a fantastic artist called Chris Boyd who makes the most amazing kind of glitch art, video art, really beautiful and it, um, it, he'd made a piece that explored his own um, background um, where, uh, where his family had had a tradition of uh, shamanistic traditional um, background um, and he'd explored this idea of kind of spirit possession in his work. So there was a whole range, there was a whole range of different talks with different people from all le different levels of belief and different levels of interest in ghosts and there was three of those and a Magic Lantern ghost show as well. So there was all <laughs> kinds of events and things there. Um, and then from there the whole exhibition went to Taiwan um, and the curators of the exhibition in, in Taiwan were very interested in this element of my project where I had collected ghost stories and as well as collecting ghost stories I'd researched Liverpool ghosts and so I had some local ghost experts talking, answering a series of questions and they said could you come to Taiwan and do a similar kind of project in Taiwan. So I of course I said yes <laughs> and I went off to Taiwan in April of this year to uh, with the exhibition and with a lot of the other artists too and the curators, we all went and um, I stayed out there a bit longer and researched ghosts for three weeks. Did you find the ghost stories were kind of the, not the same but the same kind of stories that were happening here, like they told in the same way or the, was it there was something a, more? Yeah, it, yeah, it's really interesting. It was a completely different um, relationship that people had with ghosts. And I had looked into it a little bit before I went, but not in any great depth. I'd actually been too busy still collecting Liverpool ghost stories. And um, what I found, so I had a list of questions that I prepared to give to ghost experts. So I had um, Chris French to answer the questions. Uh, then uh, um, uh, Stephen White from Merseyside Paranormal, who are paranormal investigators in, in Liverpool, he answered the same questions and Anna Winsper answered the same questions. So this series of questions were answered by people, Steve very much believes in ghosts, Chris is um, sceptic and Anne is in between, or is, on, you know, is not kind of, is interested in maybe more in why people believe in ghosts and what their, their use are and is kind of open-minded and I wouldn't like to say what her belief is like. She's more open-minded about whether they might exist as a phenomena, whether there may be some kind of phenomena mm -hmm. there. So there are different levels of approach towards ghosts, and they all answer the same questions. But when I took these questions to Taiwan, and the first person I took them to to answer was a, a spirit medium um, called Pepe, who was in Taipei, and um, she, had, she has her own temple. People go to consult her and the ghosts that she can speak to. She was horrified that I was using the word ghost hunting. She said, how can you speak about hunting ghosts? And this was all done through translation, so I can't speak 
um, Chinese, oh. and she, you know, um, um, and she couldn't speak much English. So we had a translator, live translator. So it was, it was quite, you know, it was kind of through the, and not through a medium, literally, <laughs> we were kind of communicating. And she was, she was saying to me, ghost hunting, you know, and, and everyone in Taiwan had the same reaction. Ghost hunting, it's this idea of quite aggressive, you know, capturing a ghost. Why would you do that? It could be your relative. You know, you, you need to live with ghosts. Um, so why upset them? Why antagonize them? Why imprison them? Mm -hmm. Why try to do this? So that word, you know, and the idea of paranormal research as well does exist in Taiwan, but to generally across a lot of groups of people there, the idea of trying to record a ghost or even trying you know, trying to document a ghost is somehow disrespectful. Um, but they seem so to live with them, don't yeah. they? Yeah. yeah. And accept them into their homes and leave them blessings or I think they leave them food and drink and things, don't they? They do. Well, the, 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 my residency in Taiwan, and it was way too short, I wish it had been so much longer. You know, I had three months in Liverpool, I only had three weeks in Taiwan and I was just finding things out. But it, the residency in Taiwan was called the Ghost Exchange because it was really clear that that's, it, it's the exchange with ghosts that's really key and, and um, um, that people offer ghost money, they have, it looks like money, it's kind of like stacks of banknotes and um, these are burned either at temples and the religions kind of got roots in um, this Buddhist, Taoist, um, Confucianism um, and um, it's, there are sort of many different gods and ordinary people can become gods, so ghosts be can become gods. Mm -hmm. And you, would, you might speak to gods, you might go to various different deities at the temple and speak to their spirit, who lives, their spirit lives in the temple. So you would burn ghost money to this, as an offering to this ghost spirit of the god to ask it to help you in, in whatever particular mm -hmm. properties or powers this god has. And you can also go to the temple to consult with mediums. People have temples in their own homes. They might, anyone can set one up, as Pepe had. And um, she practice, practices there, channel, sort of channeling ghosts who, are, who enable her to answer people's problems and questions, which might be quite mundane, like, you know, am I going to get the job I've gone for? Or they could be quite, you know, life, sort of, you know, life concern things about health. Um, but she'll answer any of those questions and people go for consultation and um, so there's this kind of you know and this this system of giving this money as an offering but it's also given directly to your relative or your friend when they die because when someone's before someone's cremated um, offerings of ghost money it's also called joss money um, are made and these range from things that look like money, like stacks of notes, to um, paper goods that look uh, replicas of everyday things that people would have enjoyed in their life. <laughs> like paper shoes, oh. paper toiletries, paper food. So like the Egyptians when they used to bury their pharaohs would have all the little toy versions of what they need in the afterlife. Wow. Yes, ah. very much like that. And it all made from paper. And then... Um, paper houses, so there's a whole business in ghost houses and they look like dolls' houses, the size of dolls' houses. They're, you know, if they're made by really good paper, a ghost housemaker, craftsman, because it's a family tradition, people will have done that in their family, have learned this paper craft. They'd be absolutely beautiful and they, you know, they, if you were a child, you'd, you know, be like, oh, they're <laughs> the, but they're for the ghosts. And, <laughs> Got a commission one to be made, and you can even have a little car, and you can choose what colour, and then you have different furniture, and it's supposed to be like the dream house. Um, and this house is, and the, the paper, other paper goods are burnt before the cremation, so that when the person is burnt, they have somewhere to live, and they have material things in the afterlife what to sustain them. What a idea, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And you, can keep passing things over. you can keep pass, burning things to pass it over to ah. them. So, so um, yeah, it is a 
very different, you know, very, very different experience with ghosts than we, we have here. So I had to sort of tear up my questions, really, <laughs> and start again. And just, uh, I, I spoke to Pepe, who was um, the spirit medium. Um, and so she channeled the yeah. spirits. Yeah. She, and, I, and I spoke to an urban, uh, what do you call it, an urbexer. Um, um, oh, I've forgotten his name. He has a wonderful um, blog and Facebook page called Writing Tai Tai um, Tai Chung, which is the name of the city that the exhibition was in. Writing Tai Chung, and he goes round to abandoned hospitals, abandoned psychiatric hospitals, abandoned shopping centres, and photographs and documents them and take tours. Um, and he had some some he knew the urban myths, so he collects urban legends. So he told me about the Taiwan ghost ship legend. But when I said to him, why are you going to all these places? You know, if that was in the UK, <laughs> there'd be millions of ghost walks and loads and loads of them, uh, you know, um, ghost hunting groups going there, TV, and he's going, no, 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 no. He didn't like that. He was like, no, no, I don't. He said, yeah, I've had friends who've experienced things and, and they've got ill because maybe a ghost has entered them when they're in this place, but I'm not interested in that. And most people in Taiwan wouldn't want to consciously go to try to see the ghosts or consciously try to record ghosts. Mm-hmm. So does he go to like bless the places or is that the wrong word? I, I don't know, he just didn't want, he, he, you know, it was such a different territory because even people who were um, maybe, you know, kind of academics there, who maybe um, weren't particularly um, religious but they still and and who also would kind of be a little bit wry about talking about ghosts they would still you had a real feeling that a lot of things were very important even for people that might seem you know not want to seem to be associated with some of the traditions around ghosts Mm. so they would still I bought ghost money for part of the exhibition and it was included in the installation so I had ghost money together with the ghost hunting equipment so I wanted to fuse the two cultures so I had my Liverpool ghost hunting equipment on shelves like the shelves that had been in Liverpool with the ghost puppet behind only they they became offerings so it didn't just become a shrine it became a shrine to the ghost as well as you know the ghost hiding behind your (laughs) cupboards haunting you and you're trying to film it document it record it it also became like a shrine so there were stacks of um, ghost money and there were also lotus flowers that um, the technicians made for me. They showed me how to make these beautiful lotus flowers, paper folding from ghost money. And we had, um, gosh, I hope I get the right number. Oh, that's really important as well. It's some, I think it's, I think it's, well, I hope this is right, 18. You have to have 18 because it's the number of steps up to heaven or, or to the oh. afterlife, I think. So you have to have 18 flowers or divided by 18, I think. Hope is eighteen. You have to check the website. <laughs> See, so yeah, there's um, but he was sort of you know he, I really wanted was pressing him on ghosting, but you know you're telling me stories. Do you do, do you ever experience? And he's like, no, no, my numerologically, and he was laughing because he was partly joking, saying I don't believe this, but at the same time he was using this as a reason. He said the numerology in my date of birth means that I'm not good at. Being, I'm not sensitive to ghosts. Okay. So right. it's you know it's kind of a, a you know the the the, uh, the level of belief in you know um, um, things how they treat ghosts and how they use them in their lives. Yeah, I think that it's but just kind of across you know he's talking about numerology. So there's there's more in the culture. There's more belief beliefs mm. um, in uh, you know something that um, I can't think what the word is for it you know like horoscopes and numerology and mm. you know um, so um, there's more belief in those kind of processes and then Chinese herb herbal medicine um, so there's those kind of systems already there's a lot more belief in, in um, what some people might say is just down to um, I don't want it's not the word superstition and I can't think what it is at all at the moment. Mm. My brain's just gone. Um, so yeah, he, he but he didn't want to he, he he didn't want to go to these places which in the UK would be 
Britain's Most Haunted would be down there. He didn't want to see yeah. them in that way. It was kind of, yeah, there were ghost stories there. but you know. And even the word ghost stories was a problem to people. If you said ghost stories, they thought you meant a ghost film. <laughs> you know, or someone had written a story like to scare you. They mm. didn't have an understanding of every day, like the ghost, you know, and in, because encountering more liaising, more discuss, you know, with ghosts is so every day that it's not really a story. No, because it's part of their <laughs> yeah. everyday life. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. And they probably think with us, you know, our go- we've got Ghostbuster films and things like that. That's what we do when we're interested in ghosts. Totally, so then would be disrespectful, yeah. wouldn't it? How <laughs> dare we go and try and trap them, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> put them in boxes yeah. and hide them away in a yeah. ghost house? Um, yes. Yeah. Or in a ghost prison or something. Yeah. And yeah, they should be able to roam freely on yeah. the planet. And you might you might annoy them too because there are sort of all different levels of ghosts and some of them are, are not so nice. So in the temples, as well, they, they they try to keep these these sort of unwanted ghosts out by uh, the temple doorways have a little step just inside them, a kind of raised step just inside the bottom of the doorway, and that's to stop the ghosts coming in. And um, if you stand on that as a Western Western visitor without knowing what it's about everyone's really freaked out because you're allowing the ghosts through, they get through your body oh, and into the temple you. and then it has to be cleansed out, the ghosts <laughs> from the temple. I think so it's then ghosts can't climb steps. They can't climb steps, they're like darlings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow, are they just going on the ground? Yeah, <laughs> they, there's, there's all kinds of ghosts there. So I, I have really, like Debbie, I'd really love to go back there because it's just an amazing place. Mm. Culturally, you know, and the, and the, and the language was a big barrier because everything had to be translated. So, you know, I ask a question, it translated, the person answered, and it's translated back. So mm. it makes everything quite slow, and, and then you have to find a translator. So, you know, it's, um, it was, it was uh, interesting all around doing that, and I, and, I, and I did glean a lot of information, and I did have a lot of amazing experience, thanks to the people at the National Taiwan Museum of Fine Art, um, who arranged the arranged visits for me to go to a ghost paper um, warehouse and buy some ghost money and mm-hmm. go and meet some ghost house makers and I borrowed three beautiful ghost houses for my installation so on the top shelf in between the TVs that were showing footage from Merseyside Paranormals investigations in Liverpool we had ghost houses all lit up oh, so it looked, really, it looked really lovely and then um, uh, and then, but I also had a, a student who I taught in the in London, who was from Taiwan. He said, "Well, if you're ever in Taiwan, get in touch." And I got in touch and ta- went to in Taiwan. And Taiwanese people are so hospitable, and she was the person who took me to the spirit medium. Her mother visited Pepe regularly, and she said, "We'll take you to see her." So that was their gift to me was to take me to see the medium. Who insisted on giving me a consultation? I really didn't want one. Oh, you did? No, oh. I just wanted to interview her. Right. I didn't okay. want her to give me a reading at all, um, because I try not to. I try to remain neutral because, it, it, for the purposes of research, the project is a neutral platform mm. in which to kind of manifest the ghost, interrogate the idea of the ghost, and allow people from different backgrounds of belief, different backgrounds of research to come together to do this. So me present, you know, having any, giving any opinion about this in any direction is going to um, maybe alienate one group or another group. So I, don't, I thought I don't want to have a reading, you know, so I didn't record, well actually my partner recorded it, so there is a record of it. <laughs> um, and, one of the, and I did take one of her bits of advice, but she told me to cut my fringe so you can see my eyebrows or I'll never have any money. Wow. <laughs> but that would be advice for you, so not everybody has to cut yeah. their fringe off their eyebrows. I, quite, I, don't, I don't know, I think it might be quite a Chinese thing about being able to see your face, so you can oh, read okay. the face or something. But I haven't had, got any extra money lately, so you know, it's not working yet. <laughs> you just trim your, your fringe again. Yeah, cut it even shorter. Um, so yeah, Tai yeah Taiwan and ghosts and they um, and Pepe described ghosts and kind of talked about what they looked like and she talked about when she first saw them. So her interview is on the the ghost portal website. It's a section on Taiwan and you can read it there and you can I think it's actually the recording part of the recording, not my reading with her, but the rest of the recording 
is on there. So anyone who can speak um, a Taiwanese, it's a, it's a sort of more traditional Chinese, then, then you'll be able to, or you can speak Chinese, you'll be able to understand it. And, that, and if for anyone else, it's being live translated, so you can kind of hear. Well, that'd be a good thing answers. to listen to, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you'll get out myself, yes. She's amazing. She was a real character. She was great. Was name. she quite an old lady? Or yes. Still, yeah, oh, well, no, 16. That's not that old. No, it's not that old. But, that old, but no. meant she'd been doing yeah. it for a while. Yeah. Though. yeah. She'd so. been doing it for a while. She said she's, she'd been, like a lot of people that have the ghost experiences, she said it started when she was young and she knew she was seeing ghosts. And, um, but she only got the calling to become a spirit medium fairly late in life. She was very ill. And then Buddha, she said, Buddha was telling me, I must do this. Oh, yeah. mm. wow. So people talk directly to gods, ghosts and ancestors. There's an old anthropological book um, called Gods, Ghosts and Ancestors, in a, I think in a Taiwanese village, which I read before I went, um, uh, which is very interesting. It's in, in sort of um, current Taiwanese cultural studies. It's quite, it's they find they're a bit uncomfortable with it for lots of reasons because um, it does have an element of um, this kind of anthropology thing, you know, this idea of, of of the Westerner coming in and looking at other cultural groups and kind of making their analysis mm. of them, but not really fully understanding it. So there's that it has been there's a critique of it. There's a lot of critique of it in Taiwanese um, sort of uh, st- co- sort of historical and cultural studies around around um, this, this idea of the, 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 the gods, ghosts and ancestors. But um, it's, it is still a very relevant book. I'd recommend it if anyone wants an introduction to gods, gods and ghosts. Yes. Well, because I'm, I'm interested in gods, I've been studying theology for many, many years, and um, obviously that brings up things like ghosts and the paranormal, and uh, so that's the kind of book I would be interested in. But I was told many years ago that if you wanted to contact the ancestors, you did write down what you wanted to say to them or request and then you burnt it and it went up into the smoke and the smoke went to the ethereal world. So I find that quite interesting what you were saying about what they were doing out there or burning everything or little uh, effigies or, well not effigies, but things for them that they'd need in the next they life. Do, yeah. There are some effigy burning things going oh, is on. There There's a bit all? of a sinister side to the house that's burnt. There's two little figures, a little male figure and a little female figure, paper figure in the house. And I, I asked, who are those? And I was told, these are the servants. Ooh. So they get burnt. And, uh, so, that they're st- <laughs> so they have servants on the other side. Ooh. Which they might probably wouldn't have had in, li- in a life. And there's also another kind of, you know, um, bit capitalist element to this kind of go after life too, because some people buy two houses for their relative um, so that if uh, when they, you know, go into this uh, and go into an, an, an another dimension and take their ghost houses with them, they've got a spare one to rent out because some people can't afford a ghost house for their relative. <laughs> <laughs> make a bit of money renting it to them. So that kind of thing's going on <laughs> yeah. on the other side as well. Yeah. Oh God, and rent prices are ex- <laughs> very expensive on this side. So I don't know what they'd be like on the other side. Cheeky. I know you'd have to. You can just imagine the ghost leaving a little note saying, you know, please send more ghost money to my rent is due. You know, like, I wonder if we could build our own things for when we die. Like, I might go home and build myself a nice ghost palace. And if I should go before you, Sarah, maybe you could burn it for me. Okay. <laughs> I, would, I would do that. I, I, that was a, I think this is something we could do here, definitely. In Taiwan, I think you would have a problem. Um, I w- really wanted to have a model made of my space, my installation as a ghost house. Oh, yeah. And this did not translate. I understood it as a poetic thing and that it would be a space that, you know, the, the, the haunting that I'd left, if you like, because I kind of haunted the space with my presence after I'd gone could then be burnt in ghost month because just at the end of the exhibition, it's ghost month in Taiwan, kind of around August, July. And they burn lots of things to ghosts, and they have lots of festivals to interact with ghosts at that time of year. And I thought that would be a, a, a lovely way to end the show, but it, it didn't translate. Even to people in the museum who are maybe not really necessarily practitioners around those areas of ghost interaction, they said, no, no, you can't really do that. It's not really appropriate. And I guess it would be... 
Oh, and I was trying to think of the equivalent because I'm, you know, I, I don't have a religious background here, but there were things that would offend people from maybe Christian groups here if you did, you know. The, mm-hmm. So it was a, it was a bit, but a bit offensive and inappropriate if I had done that, done that. you know, oh, to okay. a lot of people. Um, and also the ghost money that I had in the exhibition could not be sent to me. So everything else, hopefully, has come back from Taiwan, <laughs> and. Um, but the ghost money that was part of the installation had to be burnt by the museum because I'd put it in the museum. It was my gift to the museum and they had to burn it. Oh, wow. I know, so, you know. Mm. And I, th- I thought there's a lot more research to do here around all of these. There's, you know, the reasons why that has to be and why, you know. Because um, you think maybe the first thing you said about having, doing your... Um like a replica of your installation had been that burnt, maybe because you're still alive. Yes, there's nobody dead, it's going to. Yes, it's not going that. to anyone dead. Right. And, you know, and I, and I was thinking, yeah, you know, it could, you know, make, you know, I could say that it's for dead relatives of mine, you know, um, but I, 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 I think that, again, it wouldn't, you know, maybe it's too, too long after they've died or it doesn't sort of um, mm. work right, in that yeah. way. There's probably something more to it, yeah, isn't there? There's like more to, you need it, to go and research. Yes, it. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I hope you do get to go back out there, and then we could do another show and you tell me more about <laughs> it all. It's very interesting. It's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, especially you know if you if you're interested in ghosts, mm. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing place to be. And the 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 urban explorer, his legend of the Taiwan ghost ship. I mean, that was um, you know that was that was. A kind of common thing, this idea of a ship coming and taking people's souls away. It was there been a, 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 a fire in a, a shopping centre, I think it was a building um, in a shopping centre, and a lot of people had died, and the ship was seen taking their souls away. And it's been seen in other places too, because it was said that the ship needed to have a certain number of souls before it could pass across into another, you know, go into an afterlife. Um, and um, you know, I think that you know, the story ha- does appear across lots of different cultures. This kind of ghostly, ghostly ship, and ghost ships are made out of, out of ghost money and burn as well. Um, wow. So yeah, that's been. But it's it's lovely to think of it being seen like in downtown Taichung, in a you know um, shopping centre. This ghost ship appearing, and then the dead souls yeah. going to it, and then off it goes. Yeah. That's quite interesting that it has to wait till it's got a certain amount of people, because that maybe that's where purgatory came from or something. Yeah, I don't know. No, I don't know, but <laughs> there's an idea just running yeah, to my head then. Or, wonder, you know, that's why you're waiting on the ship until you've got you know however many they need, but then you go to the next realm. <laughs> I know it's so. These rules are interesting, aren't they? You think where do these rules come from? Yeah, the numerical thing. Maybe that's another numerology thing. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Um, he did have a photo, um, uh, the, the urban explorer, the writing Taishung man, and I'm sorry for forgetting for his name. Um, he had um, uh, a photograph of one of these buildings and he was claiming there was a face. I couldn't see it. He claimed there was a face in the window, but I couldn't see anything. Oh. I couldn't see, couldn't see it. Um, but, he, but at the same time as he wanted to show me that, he didn't want to really... Like share it with you. Emphasise oh. ghosts as being important. Oh, I see. As right. being a, you know, something that he went to look for hmm. in these spaces, which are the kind of exactly the kind of things that a lot of people who were would go to to look for in the spaces. And it was because of you know, it not being appropriate to do that to hunt them. Hmm. Because hmm. in the Western world, you've got a lot of photos of like, ghosts in windows yeah. and ghosts in yeah. doorways and things like that. So, hmm, interesting. Well, on to the next bit. I was going to ask you about your ghost puppet, because I myself make puppets and have a few of them, uh, films of mine, which are William Blake and mainly William Morris. So um, can you tell me a bit more about your ghost puppet and how you use it to use it to tell stories, don't you? Um, it has. It, I use it in performances, um, so it's and it's also it is um, shown as a sculptural piece, an installation piece, um, and it's also used in performances. It's it appeared. There's been different versions, so I've made several different versions of it. Um, 
It was made initially, originally for an exhibition called Theatrical Dynamics that was in um, Los Angeles in 2012. A friend of mine, David Leapman, curated it. And, um, that was all the clue he gave to what the exhibition was going to be, Theatrical Dynamics. And I just was, you know, me being interested in ghosts. I'm, and I had also got a history of working with puppets from another project called The Chutney Preserves which um, group of artists, we, make pu- we made puppets, we had puppet wars, and they were all marionettes. And um, they kind of, you know, uh, a lot of the artists who made the puppets, they still do projects with the puppets to this date, like Callum F. Kerr, his puppet, Grandpa Frankie, that was made for the Chinese <laughs> preserves. And it's got a life of its own now, so all these kind of puppets were born there. As you know, because you make them, they're amazing things, mm. and they, they lend themselves to, to performance. So I was interested in the marionette performance and the idea of how, when you have a puppet, and I've taught puppet making classes, somebody gets a puppet in their hand and they immediately start talking and moving the puppet as if it's a separate thing to themselves. Mm-hmm. And however shy someone is, they suddenly start performing and doing a little voice like, hello, or whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. and start moving around. And it's like they've gone and they've embodied, you know, they, this, they've kind of gone into this puppet. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a really lovely idea about the ghost and kind of about, you know, you, you, you actually have to lift the ghost up to make it haunt you. And then you enter the ghost and you kind of haunt people. So the ghost can only be haunting you. You know, it's the guest and the host. You need to, you need to be the guest inside the, go- inside the ghost. Because <laughs> he's like a white sheet, isn't he? The yeah, white sheet little... type ghost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just explain what he looks like. It's like a, a, the archetypal ghost of like a sheet, you know, a shroud over somebody. Like the film that recently was out, Ghost Story, which I haven't seen. I don't know if you've no, seen, I've not it. seen it. No, I've not seen it yet either. And it's just uh, someone walking around with a sheet on that kind of image. And um, if it was lying on the ground, it would look like a, a napkin, kind of lying down, serviette, you know. And if you if you could take the cross piece and pull it up, its little arms pop up, its head pops up, and it's going, Woo, you know, it's it, kind yeah. of, or, or I'm going, Woo. <laughs> and so I'm kind of putting my, you know, myself into this inanimate object and animating it and. Um, so, it, you know, it, recently I, I told some ghost stories as part of a project called Inspiral London. Um, and we were doing an Inspiral London festival in uh, Gravesend. And Charlie Fox, who is the curator of the project, asked me to come and do something. And he said, could you do something about Gravesend ghosts? He sort of suggested I could explore that. And there's so many ghost stories in Kent, so it was lovely. And I told some from the paranormal database, rather than, the again, the common ones that everyone's written down and made little books, little booklets about Haunted Ken, the ones that are on the paranormal database that people have just set, sent, sent in themselves. You know? mm-hmm. um, and so I, 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 I told some of those ghost stories, and I had the little ghost puppet with me whilst I was telling the story, so it's kind of <laughs> just kind of hanging out with me. Um, so it gets used like that, and, and then it was in the show in Liverpool, and it was in the show in Taiwan. In fact, that ghost has travelled all around the world. It's been to Los Angeles, it's been to Italy, um, it's been to uh, Liverpool at Ta- uh, Taiwan. So it's, got, it's gone around. Yeah, good ghost. <laughs> He's probably got loads of ghost stories to tell. Well, one of my favourite pieces of yours, of your um, pieces of art, is the You Are Here um, which is called You Are Here, isn't it? it Can is. you describe that it for is. us and what that was all about? Um, you Are Here, that was from 2006. That um, was uh, a coffin that I built that fits me. I can get into it. I think just about, I need to die a bit. I can just about still get in it. <laughs> and um, it's built for me. I lay on the floor, somebody drew the shape around me and we built this coffin. Um, and uh, it's uh, a plywood sort of pauper's coffin, really, you know, it's not an expensive one, it's just an everyday kind of coffin. Um, It sits on two trestle legs, and so you have to sort of kneel at the foot of the coffin to see a little spy hole, so a little hole at the foot of the coffin that only one person at a time can look in, um, reveals a view into this tunnel of lights going off into infinity, and this is an infinity illusion. 
that I cr cr created inside the, the coffin. So it's just a bit like a wormhole. I guess it's, okay. it's like the ghost <laughs> tunnel. tunnel yeah, yeah, it's the same illusion. And um, it's another sort of obsession or recurring theme within my work is this idea of portals, you know, into another dimension mm -hmm. um, of time and space, life and death. And so uh, you can look down this tunnel inside the coffin, an infinite space and inside a finite space. And you can wonder about what there may be beyond life, the universe, and everything. But ultimately, you are here. Mm, it's brilliant. I love it. <laughs> well, one of the things I was interested with you was, of course, Harry Price who was known in the, uh, was the early 20th century as the ghost hunter, paranormal investigator, research reports of well, paranormal and supernatural. And uh, back in the old days, he was often in the newspapers with his reports and tests of various psychics, mediums, and poltergeists, and of course, ghost hunting. But you got involved with a lot of his work um, and his archive. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, that was um, uh, thanks to Ricardo Vidal at the University of London, she was working there at the time and we were doing the ghost project together and um, that, that our first research seminars, our first ghost hostings were at the University of London and um, in Senate House in the haunted rooms of Senate House and uh, uh, Ricardo was working there and um, I was really interested in Harry Price's archive there and uh, she said well why don't you apply to be a research fellow here at the university, and then both of us will be here at the university, you know, running the project, that made sense. So I got a research fellowship at the University of London, and um, uh, that was to research the Harry Price archive, and as a result of that I needed to have a certain academic output, and I wrote an academic paper that was published in the Ash Ashgate Research Companion to Paranormal Cultures, all about the ghost project. Um, and, but there was also a creative output to that and that was going to Harry Price's archive researching and making work in response to that and so um, I created a magical library um, in which I collected to and archived ghost stories together with Chris Joseph who was working at the library at the time. Chris is, um, was cataloguing the Harry Price archive and is an expert on Jeff, the talking poltergeist mongoose, he's written a oh. brilliant book about mm -hmm. Jeff that's just out with Strange Attractor Press and he's, um, so he was there, he knew a lot of ghost stories, he was fascinated by Price, very knowledgeable about Price. Um, and so we collected ghost stories together and they're um, on a, an archive called The Ghosts of Senate House, um, which is, to my delight, is now referenced a lot by people researching ghosts. They say, they cite it, they've been to the Ghosts of Senate House website, and, you know, and some of the, the things that we found there um, are of interest still to other people researching in that area, so that's really nice. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's, that's, that's a really rewarding that people are still engaging with this project mm. after, I think the last contribution we have is in 2014, so now it really is an archive, you know, something, might, something else might come through, but mm. it is there as an archive, and there were, there were sort of some really interesting kind of stories linking sort of to the space where Harry Price's archive was kept at Senate House because Harry Price really wanted to have recognition for what he was doing. He wanted it to be authenticated by, um, you know, uh, ac academic institution, by somebody that's got authority saying yes, stamp of approval. So he, he left his um, archive, his magical library and his laboratory of psychic research to the University of London on his death and so it's part of Senate House Library now and for quite a while it was on the eighth floor um, in a little room and it was all kept together and you could travel up to the eighth room and get a little card and browse through things. Now it's actually dispersed through the collection and if you want to get something out you have to make a special visit there and you have to look in the catalogue request something and it's brought up and you can look kind of one thing at a time really uh, so it's not the same experience that's the experience I had thing one thing coming up at a time so uh, for instance I'd be sitting there and I'd have Joanna Southgate's box of prophecies 
you know, that would come up and mm. go through the content of that, which included a lottery ticket that was a non-winning lottery ticket from the 1700s. <laughs> <laughs> and other things, and then up the, the footprint of the poltergeist mongoose, Jeff. It's great to see his footprint. And then right. some ectoplasm. I think, no, they couldn't find the ectoplasm. Helen Duncan's ectoplasm was missing. So I don't know where that had got to. But some of the things in the archive had... Um, you know, were no longer there. Some of the things that had been in his laboratory of psychical research, I think, had sadly kind of, you know, over just, I don't know, that, that period of transition from going into being just a loose collection of things into being archived, probably decayed or disappeared, you know, or broke. Um, yeah. um, because Helen Duncan was um, often quoted as being a witch, but really she was just a medium, wasn't yeah. she? And he, Harry Price, investigated her and tested her and, yeah. like you say, collected some of her ectoplasm while she did all her mediumship. She went through some horrendous things when they tested her. But, um, they did awful things mm. to her and to other women too. It's all really dodgy, the things that they did to the women. Um, and Because um, they couldn't understand how this ectoplasm was coming out of all their, their nostrils and their mouths and they... And everywhere else. Yes, everywhere else. And so they got tested in every orifice, really, didn't yes, they? Yes, they did. Awful. They but they did it in the name of science, apparently. Yes, <laughs> it's all in the name of science. Yeah, they, they you know, they, so he's his laboratory of psychical research, as you're saying, he tested mediums. He would set up a controlled seance room in which he would have scientific apparatus. Like, you know, and I love that word apparatus, you know, apparatus, where it's kind of <laughs> like the sort of apparatus. And he'd have it kind of around the room and he recorded the temperature, um, camera set up to go on if something happened and, and other things to try and record ele- levels of electricity in the, ro- in the room. And um, then docu- he minuted, someone was there doing minutes of every single thing that happened in every seance. And you can read all of those. There's, they're absolutely wonderful. So there's the accounts of Stella Cranshaw, the electric girl, and it goes by minute by minute what happens. And it's all, it gets straight down to it. The spirits don't hang around. It's not like the seances nowadays, very little happening. It's like <laughs> straight in there, the table's going crazy instantly, and it attacks the colonel's knee. And the colonel has to give a report about the bruises on his knee because the table has bashed his knee so many times. And that's a particular set table they used in what the seance is called the Slade table that had originally belonged to um, a spirit, a Slate spirit writing medium called Henry Slade, who'd stayed around the corner from Senate House. You can still see where he stayed. He stayed in number, he- number 8 Bedford Place, which is a little hotel now. And he stayed in there in an upstairs room and he practiced spirits, you know, Slate writings, mediumship there. And his table, Harry Price got hold of it. He was good at getting hold of stuff like that. He got hold of it and he did seances with it. And it's now in the College of Psychic Studies. And you can go and visit it there. It has a little plaque on the table oh, saying right. what it is. And you think, don't touch it. <laughs> Watch your knees, you know, knee pads if you go near it. That area is quite, um, Bloomsbury and Senate House are quite well known for all its magical stuff that's gone on there. Many magical people lived around that area. I wonder what it is about that area, mm, you know, yeah. what's, what's going on there. So if anyone knows, get in touch. Yeah. I mean, Sarah so wants to know. <laughs> yeah, do get in touch with your theories about why, why all this stuff is happening in that part of London. Because I could never quite figure out Harry Price whether he was trying to prove it or disprove what was going on. I think he's doing both at the same time. I think he kind of, um, you know, because he, when he's writing about Stella Cranshaw, it seems that he's concluding that she does have some kind of um, extrasensory powers. He's, he's concluding that, it seems, in, in the writing about her. Um, but he, he concludes that Helen Duncan is um, faking it, and, and other people too. So he starts off with Rudy Schneider. Because um, he bound him up, didn't yeah. he, in the chair? And then he's, wasn't it a photograph or something? Oh, I'm getting free. That's it, yeah. yes. So he started off by saying that he, his powers were genuine, and then sort of finishing by saying he was a fake. So, yeah, he, he, I think he... he I think he, whether he believed it or not, or maybe he wanted to believe, I believe it. It's really intriguing to know mm. what his to, to 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 understand what his position was on it. But he does write about things, saying that people had powers. But at the same time, he was trying to disprove them very strongly by, you know, like the Brocken experiment. He went to um, um, he went to Germany to this mountain top um, and and recreated this ex- this magic ritual in which was supposed a young goat was supposed to be turned into a beautiful young man. And he recreated this ritual to demonstrate that magic isn't real, you know, and kind of um, 
it was, you know, and so he was, performed the ritual. Didn't yeah, he? It's he like he was the, and would it be the high priest, or whatever? Didn't he? Yeah. yeah, he did it all himself. And he, and he really got into it. Mm. You can see this little film at Senate House. You can watch the the film footage of that, and it's great. Oh, I didn't know it's, there was film footage. Yeah, I'm not film to look that up. Oh. It's, you can, it's only I think they've only got it at Senate House. I don't. I haven't found. It might be on YouTube by now because all this stuff is becoming much more known about. So you know, but I, as far as I'm aware, that film is still just in Senate House Library. And it shows Harry Price doing the ritual, and um, uh, the, the the sort of young actress that he's got to be the young virgin in her white dress, <laughs> and the little goat, and all the. What's really disturbing, and there's lots of kind of um, dignitaries there and members of the Nazi Party watching this happening because Harry Price had a, didn't mind who he he got to help him out because he was well, anyone that was gonna. Help him get. Well, he offered it to Hitler, yeah, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. Or, or not? Well, I maybe to Hitler to whoever was in charge. To, yeah, he wanted to go to the Nuremberg rallies. I think he wanted. To, he asked for a front row seat. So whether he was a sort of Nazi sympathizer or just totally unscrupulous and just wanted anyone that seemed like they were, whether he was enamoured of anyone that seemed like they had any kind of power or charisma, mm. I don't know. I think it was the latter myself, from yeah. what I've read of him. You know, I'm not an expert, I've never met him, so I don't know. <laughs> but um, I felt like he he did want to find anyone, and here in England, nobody was really taking him seriously, were they? No. But the Germans, the Nazis, were looking for all kinds of paranormal yeah. stuff, and there's all kinds of tales about them, which we weren't going to hear, of what they were up to. And Hitler was very into the occult, so... And, and they were up saying, yeah, bring it to us. I'm sure you'd be like, yes. Yes, if they're going to pay, you're going to pay for me to come over mm. to Germany and do an ex experiment turning a goat into a young man? Uh, I'll do I'll it. I'll do it, yes. <laughs> and, and I'll be on, because it was on Pathé News, I think. So it was kind of, it was shown all over Europe and America, this news clip. So it would have, you know, been a bit of fame and fortune for him. Mm. Um, and travel and glamour. That's you know, it, so yeah. I think he, you know, the little film clip of him in his... Um, Laboratory of psychical research with this pipe, you know, is is just marvellous, and you get an idea of him from that. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very fond of him. I think he was a bit of a charlatan, a bit of a, uh, but also a bit of a romantic. He wanted to prove these things, and he did a tremendous amount, you know, to getting his archive into the University of London. I don't think they particularly wanted it at the time, but he got it in there, you know. <laughs> and it's uh, when he wrote to Sir Edwin Deller, he was uh, the um, uh, or the headmaster, I wanted to say, you know, the, the, the man in charge. That is what I've been, but you know, the, yeah, the, the head, the, the principal of the University of London at the time, Sir Edwin Deller, he wrote to him asking him if he'd take the archive there, in, and, and he said, no, we can't. It didn't get through the final votes of the committee deciding if we're going. And strangely, Ed, Sir Edwin Deller died in Senate, in, while Senate House was being built, being inspecting the, um, inspecting the lift shaft. Some, some rubble fell and landed on him and some other people visiting. And his ghost is now said to haunt every single lift shaft, every single lift in Senate House is wow. haunted by Sir Edwin Deller's ghost. He's been seen in all of them. Ah, I could believe that, though, because Senate House, there's something about it, isn't it? And it's a beautiful building, but it looks like something that should be full of ghosts, and it's old and, you know, modern London all around it. It's an amazing building. It is, yeah, it is an amazing building, and it's got um, this haunting kind of sound, just something the way that the building's been structured, the tower, it causes the wind to really howl, so that wind's going... <whistles> like this, all around the building while you're sitting in there, um, when it's quite often when it's not windy anywhere. Wow, <laughs> so that's all the ghosts going yeah, around. <laughs> souls going round and round, yeah, so it's, and there are... There are strange noises and things there. I wouldn't have wanted to be in the, the stacks, which are the tower of the building. There's floor after floor of books, and they're in cages along middle corridors. And at one time, the lights only came on when you sort of waved your hand, and then you, you know, the, uh, naturally, you can, now they only come on if you wave your hand, but then one time they only came on if you pulled a little switch, and you had to turn the switches off as you went out so you had darkness behind you as you left mm. all these corridors of books I wouldn't have wanted to go up and fetch a book from up there and now I, I think people even get a bit sort of spooked going up to get a book from the stacks some members of the library staff had ghost stories they all remained anonymous they didn't want to give their names mm. but they had ghost stories about I'm um, going up to the stacks to get books 
<laughs> Did a little website of Senate House Ghost Stories. There is. That's, that's, ah. all, of, that's all yeah. on the Ghosts of Senate House website, all of those ghost stories. Excellent. Collected with Chris Joseph. So did you ever feel that when you were researching Harry Price's work and playing with his hunting, ghost hunting equipment, did you ever feel he was around? Um, <laughs> mm. More likely, I, I, I think the mongoose was there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yes. Yeah. I think the mongoose was, was around. I remember yeah. first hearing about the mongoose story and I was like, oh, I've got to go and hear about the talking mongoose. And I came away thinking that was quite a depressing, sad tale, um, which it's too long to go into here, but um, Harry Price did go and research it himself, didn't he? He went out there to, was it the Isle of Man? Or the He's Isle on the Isle of Man, Man yeah. Oh, yes. And uh, tried to... He took a photo, didn't he? It looks more like a cat or something. I, th- I, th- um, Voiry, I think that's how you say her name. Um, the, the daughter of the, the Irwins, who um, were the family that were haunted by... The Irvins, the family that were haunted by um, Jeff. Um, they lived in this isolated farmhouse, the Isle of Man. She was the main communicator with Jeff. Um, and she photographed him. She was given a camera um, by Price and... Um, is it Lambert? Um, and asked to photograph Jeff and she took those photographs mm. she went to her grave saying it all happened it was she never denied it a bit like the woman who you know the poltergeist girl the Enfield poltergeist woman who, who was a girl at the time um, yeah so she um, she said she wished none of it had ever happened to her um, you know she said it affected her whole life but she said it had happened, it had been real. Because mm. he was like a little, little, Jeff was like a little mongoose creature that went around and knew everybody's gossip, yeah. he? and he used to ridicule other, because other town people saw him, it yeah. wasn't just her, was it? Other, yeah. um, and used to tell them naughty things that they'd been up to, and they'd be like, how does he know? Yeah, and, yeah very strange he knew little creature, yeah. Very mischievous. Mm. But Harry um, Price investigated the Enfield poltergeist as well, didn't he? So did he? Did he? Or have I, I got it a bit mixed up? I think so. Oh, that right, was okay. later. That was much later after he died. He went to Borley Rectory. Oh, that's it, Borley Rectory for yeah. none. His ghost, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> went and checked out the Enfield, Enfield one. <laughs> um, no, he went to Borley Rectory um, and he, you know, he described it as Britain's most haunted house. Mm. And he advertised in the Times for people to come and join a ghost you know, um, vigil there, and they had to spend the night, and they were given instructions about wearing soft-soled shoes and taking a flashlight, some brandy, and all these different things they had to bring with them to kind of help them with their ghost hunting, and then keep an account of what happened. Um, and uh, all those things, all those accounts of what happened, are all in Senate House Library and, and the Price's archive. So, you know, when, and when you were saying about who did I feel was there, I think I only felt all the women, all the mediums, you know, I was really interested in all those mediums that he tested and it's said possibly had a, affairs with as well. Wow. And with his, with his secretary, Lucy Kay, you know, they, they, you sort of wonder about what were the human stories going on behind all of this mm. investigation and what the relationships were with people. That kind of, those ideas hung around me a lot when I was there. I was particularly interested in Stella Cranshaw, the electric girl. She seems to have just, he met her on a bus, she was in her 20s, very young. 22 or 23. She was a dental nurse. She, he said to her, I think you've got psychic powers, come and be tested. <laughs> and, um, you know, she had this short period of being able to produce electric blue sparks and um, lilac flowers falling from the air and all these, you know, and t- tables attacking Colonel's knees. And then it all just seemed to disappear and she just went on and just, you know, had a normal, seemingly life. normal un, you know, eventful life mm. after that. Because when I've done research about people like that, it has normally been in their teen years. And uh, I've read a lot about what Jung was saying about it perhaps being some kind of sexual energy attracts this kind of thing or perhaps creates it. It'd be interesting to know more about that kind of thing. Yes, yeah, he, he did look at one sort of teenage girl who, um, I'm trying to remember her name, I her name's gone, that, that, that had sort of... But it, that's quite disturbing, her story, because, you know, it's, it's quite violent, the things that are happening to her. And they, they quite, quite often are, aren't they, with sort of, you know... With, with the teenage girls sort of almost possessed, almost kind of, you know, possessed by the ghosts, and there's an element of violence, and mm. it, it's very disturbing. Because um, if ghosts do feed off energy, which is what a lot of the research I've done has been about, which is why ghosts come to certain people and love teenagers, because of that energy that's in them. 
somehow that electrical energy that we pulsate round ourselves when we're going through um, I was going to say menopause then, but I don't mean menopause. <laughs> I mean the other one. <laughs> Puberty. Well, Puberty, yes. <laughs> you know, it attracts, apparently, ghosts like that kind yeah. of thing. They live off it. So I can see why youngsters get involved in this kind of thing. And when you're young, you also want to play with Ouija boards and tarot cards, and that attracts them even more. So I can see why Harry Price was probably interested in young girls as well then. <laughs> Their uh, energy. Yes, their energy. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't do anything untoward. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Sarah. It's been fabulous. Thank it's you been so a really much. good talk. Oh, what's your website again? Just one more I've time. I've got so many. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll give the three ghost websites. Okay. Ghost for people interested in ghosts and art. They're, 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 they're art projects that are exploring ghosts. Well, we talked about the Ghosts of Senate House, so that's Ghosts of Senate House. Um, um, and then there's the ghostportal.co.uk, that's the Liverpool ghost stories and the Taiwan ghost research. And then there's ghosthostings.co.uk, and that's the website for the ghost project. You'll find out about all of the ghost hostings, all 18, the various different exhibitions, events, and there's lists of all the people that have taken part in ghost um, hostings. Oh, that's marvellous. So, Oh, well, thank you very much and all the best of all the thank future you. art thank exhibitions you. and ghost huntings and more and hopefully we'll talk more yeah. in the future. Yeah. Thank, thank you very will. much, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.